And I said, okay, what's the next subject? Castle construction. Okay, yes. Castle construction. And it's a good thing that we are near Zendar. So, you can build up to six castles. Six castles in Novaethus. Anywhere you want. Anywhere you want. I've built only one Invasion Point castle. It was more than enough to serve as a staging ground, as an Invasion Point. I know, I know, subtle, subtle name for the castle. Uh, as, an, as a staging ground to start my own faction. I recommend that you do not build a castle when you're part of a faction as a vassal. So let's say I'm part of uh, the Swadians. Let's say I'm part of the Swadians. If I build a castle while I'm part of the Swadians, uh, the castle will go automatically to the Swadians, and the Swadians will act like you captured a castle and will either give it to you or refuse to give it to you. So for the love of God, don't build a castle if you want it to, to definitely be your own, okay? Don't build a castle if you definitely want it to be your own. Keep that in mind. Okay, um, so what do you need to build a castle? And how do you build a castle? You go to any point, camp, take an action, create construction site, okay? Uh, name the castle whatever you want. Uh, schnitzel castle just schnitzel because the suffix of castle will be added and a castle will start being built true true that is true chris you can use a castle as a rebellion true then you can just rebel and you take it for yourself and then you need to provide you need to hire laborers and then you need to come over and provide timber stone and tools now the timber stone and tools will go up each week without you having to do anything. So this will appear passively, but it will simply take a longer time. If you bring the resources yourself from villages or from cutting them, cutting them down yourself or from uh, marketplaces, you will increase the speed at which the castle will be built. But in time, this castle will be built on, on its own and in my case, if I have my own faction, it will go automatically on my side, and then I can reward it to a vassal or keep it for myself. And castles act the same way. Since we're talking about castles, let's talk a little bit about castle management. Now, you simply manage the garrison, and you can recruit troops from the castle. So, a castle has two recruitment slots. I can train Colretic Empire sharpshooters, which are ready. Oh, and I actually have some ready troops here. Cool. And they joined my side. Awesome. Colorotic Empire Sharpshooters. Uh, let's recruit some troops. So, train new troops. Technology tier 2, please. And I would like 10 armored arquebusiers. Begin training, and in a few days, they're going to be ready, and I'm going to be able to get them. Yes, I can get Colorotic units now. Um, because I've founded the Colradic Empire, Chris. All right, so that's pretty much it for castles. There's nothing else to extra. There's nothing else extra to work inside castles. This was my capital for a long time until I took Zendar, and it was quite fun. Uh, the Colradic Empire troops look like this. I'm gonna talk. Ab I'm gonna talk about them a little bit more later on, but I'm gonna show them to you right now. Town management recruits, and we're gonna talk about town management in a second as well. Uh, they're this guys, Colradic legionnaire, uh, Colrad, uh, Colrad centurion. They're pretty weak. They're pretty weak. They're just culture flavor troops, and the Coloradian equities which is a mounted skirmisher unit. They're very Roman. They're Roman. Even the flag of the Colorado Empire is super Roman. Bam. Yeah. Okay, so... What was I talking about? About castle. About castle construction. Okay. Let me see if I've mentioned everything. Good. Now we can switch up to village management and village construction. Let's go to Padria, which is one of my villages. 
And now we're going to go a little bit into Age of Empire territories. A little bit of Age of Empire territories. Belongs to me. Oh, um, the village a little bit hates me because I think I let it uh, get raided a few times. But what, what you going to do? I want to manage my village. And now we reach the manage village screen. Yeah, more of a decoration thing, Chris. So I want to place a new building. We can build schools, town walls and stuff. And when you do this, you will need uh, resources exactly like the colonies. You will need 10 timber, 6 stone and stuff like that. I want to order the construction. And if I visit, if I go to the village center now, you will actually be able to, to see the building getting constructed real time over here. Actually, not sure which is the schoolhouse currently, but it's here somewhere. It seems to remember this. Uh, this village is actually pretty. Oh, there it is. No, that's the blacksmith's. Ah, oh, that's the blacksmith. No, right. Is it over there? Maybe. It's all right. The idea is you will once once it's built or while it's building, you'll be able to see the buildings inside the village real time. So a little bit of immersion is awesome. So one of village, my village, what else can you do? You can assign jobs to villagers. So in this case, we have 27 villagers and all of them are currently unemployed. You can tell them to go grab food, go grab wood, and go grab... Uh, you can send them to the blacksmith and they're going to be producing um, tools for you boys. If you send them to the stone cutters, they're going to be producing food. Uh, sorry, stone. So literally, Age of Empire, right here. Age of Empire, arrange them as you feel like it. If you have a surplus of food, the population of the village will go up, of course. If you ha don't have enough food, the population of the village will go down. You can set up the new tax levels, and we can also provide a donation to the treasury or just take everything. And just a big, big information with guides on how you can manage the village simply by talking with the village elder. Hello, Spectre. Hello, Chris. Please stop uh, Stop doing that. Thank you. <laughs> also, Spectre, welcome back to the end, my man. And that is pretty much it for villages. Uh, usually... It's not worth it to just go and manage the village on your own, only for role-playing purposes, or if you need some extra prestige, because each time you upgrade a village church, you receive... And each time you build a uh, structure, it will either provide a bonus to the time it takes to be raided, or simply provide a bonus to prestige. And that's it for villages. Now, let's get into the nit and gritty. The amazing system that they managed to introduce in uh, Nova Ethos, the town management system from medieval, from Total War Games, uh, medieval. Whew. And <clears throat> I feel my voice going away. And this is going to be quite a explanation. In the overview you'll be able to see all of the structures that are already built. If you click on them, they will provide you with information, how much does it cost to demolish, and what do they provide for the town? What do they provide for the town? I've selected the church, the Orthodox wooden church, and I'm trying to convert the city to Christianity and Orthodoxy. This will give me 1% conversion rate each week, plus two piety and 250 prestige. Okay, the irrigation will provide 2% income and 2% growth. As you can see, I have 1% growth, so the population of Zendar is slowly, slowly going upwards. Mm, what else? Oh, there are also some, um, some, uh, city, some, city, some buildings that are built just for aesthetic purposes, like the town hall, will provide me with a new castle scene, and will provide me with just prestige. So, the reason... When I go to the castle, like so, this room over here is as fancy as you can see because I have that uh, that uh, building built. Okay, so in the overview, you will simply receive information about the town and what it provides. Also, uh, to recruit certain type of characters is exactly like in medieval. 
you'll need the arquebusier range to um, recruit gunpowder units. You're gonna need um, where's the is this the stables? Yeah, the large stables. Um, this will unlock the Empire Lancer or the Empire Gendarme. So you will need a certain type of buildings for you to recruit. And speaking of recruiting, let's go to the recruiting section. Exactly like in Total War Medieval, or in all of the Total War games, you have a list with the type of troops that you wish to level up. And when you create your own faction, you select the culture of the faction that you wish to utilize. I've selected the Rodox. Uh, but be aware of this empire, let's say, let's say I uh, recruit empire levies. Be aware that your troops from your faction, the Coloradic Empire Levy in this case, cannot be upgraded. He will not become a Empire Spearman or an Empire Crossbowman, okay? Be aware of that. Don't go right now and start recruiting Empire Levies up the ass because you will regret it. So what I recommend is that you simply select the highest tier units that you wish to go for, like the Colorado Empire Armor Arquebusier in my case. Check the costs. Check the recruits that you have. This will re uh, this will go up based on your growth rate over time, and see if you can uh, hire them up. And each each slot represents ten soldiers. Ten soldiers. So I can recruit ten Armor Arquebusiers or uh, ten Empire Halberdiers or ten Empire Sharpshooters. And this recruitment method is the only way for you to access gunpowder units uh, besides saving them from prisoner trains. Okay? Keep that in mind. Now, let me go to the construction. Oh, of course, if you want to see the stats, you can click on any of the soldiers and click on troop stats. Bam! You're going to be able to see everything. And then, what else do we have? Construction? Okay, in the construction tab, you'll be able to see all of the cities and uh, all of the buildings that you can construct, plus upgrades to already existing city, uh, uh, existing buildings. So, for example, I have a Orthodox wooden church. I can build a Orthodox stone church, which, which is going to provide an extra 1% conversion rate and plus degree piety and so on and so forth. I can build a fair ground, 3% income, or I could just build a feudal town hall for a f an extra 150 prestige if I'm hurting for prestige, which I really don't. Also, there are shaft mines, which will provide an extra income, and also universities and schools will be able to provide you with uh, tech uh, with a percentage of tech points that you receive each, each week from researching stuff. So try to build as many universities as possible. Okay. And if you click on details, okay, so if you click on details, you're going to be able to see the balance of power inside the town. The growth factors based on all of the buildings that you have and all of the edicts that you've uh, placed over here. So let me talk with you guys a little bit about balance of power. This will also come into play um, during kingdom management, but it's mostly here. It's mostly here during the town management. So balance of power is simply the power that's um, divided between the four classes of citizens inside a town the nobility the clergy the bourgeoisie and the craftsmen now you can shift the power between the classes based on edicts to proclaim edicts you need to go to the castle not to the town management you need to go to the castle and talk to the guy to these two guys the Commissioner of Justice and the Commissioner of Economical Affairs. And there's another dude over here. Yeah, the Town Guildmaster. So, at the Town Guildmaster, he will tell me a summary, exactly like the Village Elder. He will give me a summary of what's going on inside the city. Tell me about the balance of power. And he, through him, you'll be able to hire the other two commissioners. Also, you can ask him questions about all of the aspects of town management 
and it'll go into much more details that I'm explaining over here. I'm giving you a basics of to not fuck things up, you know? So, let's go and talk with the Commissioner of Justice and the Commissioner of Economical Affairs. The Commissioner of Justice is the guy uh, you talk to to uh, proclaim edicts. Sadly, we do not have enough money right now because we need more money in the treasury of the city to proclaim edicts. But just to give you a heads up, an edict will give, will cause an event like tax collection, which will take power from the commoners and give it to no nobility. Or let's do a festival, which is going to increase powers to commoners and decrease it to the clergy and nobility. Or let's do an inquisition, that's going to increase the power of the clergy and decreases the power from the other classes. But then you ask yourself, what do each of these do and why do you care? Okay. So, let me explain. The nobility makes it possible for you to proclaim edicts quicker. Each edict has a 30-day cooldown, but if you give uh, the nobility a little bit more power, that cooldown will, will, be, um, will, be, will be smaller depending on the power that the nobility possesses. The bourgeoisie will make buildings cheaper and will provide extra income from taxes each week. Each week. Uh, currently, if I go to town management, sorry, sorry, if I go to the castle and talk to the guildmaster, he's going to be able to tell me, or no, no, I, th I think I need to talk with the uh, economical guy, economical affairs. He's going to tell me about how much money the city is making. Yeah. So currently, this generates 289,450 florins per week. Yep. And giving more power to um, the bourgeoisie will increase that factor. Okay. Then, the clergy will increase religious uniformity. Remember, taxes are only paid uh, by the um the people of your religion and if you're an atheist atheist um only people of the majority of the religion in the town will pay taxes so keep that in mind keep that in mind currently religion uniformity is at 40 percent, and that 40 percent is paying me to almost 250k yeah per week per week so giving uh, power to the clergy will increase this number, thus giving you more money, and will also decrease corruption. So um, tax evasion and stuff like that will decrease. I know, weird, but that's what it does. And then if you give power to the craftsmen, uh, this will simply give an increase to uh, population, to growth. This will directly affect growth. Uh, the craftsmen are the common people, the commoners. If you give power to them, this will directly impact and increase growth. And also, if you don't maintain a balance, uh, they will start bitching about it and do bad, bad events for you. Okay. Also, um, having low taxes will uh, promote growth to the town. It's a good idea to keep this on the low um, so that you always, always keep new people coming in and this also increases your recruits a little bit faster Re uh, you know replenishes your recruit stocks faster now uh, these are my suggestions to have to maintain a healthy city a healthy city always try to keep the growth on the positive in the early game focus on religious uniformity so give some more power to the clergy. Uh, nobility power is really not that important in town management because edicts, you're not going to be proclaiming too many edicts anyway. Not too many. And once you have a decent amount of religious uniformity, give power to the craftsmen or give power to the, power to the bourgeoisie depending on how many... How many um, towns or or buildings you want constructed for right now for example i'm probably going to keep, keep on going for orthodox stone church just to increase that religious uniformity um and then keep on focusing on growth because that's the surefire way of producing as many soldiers as possible so please
play around with this balance of power and see what you can come up with. This town management is especially, especially fun uh, when you're a vassal of a faction and they give you a town. Especially fun then. But you really don't have to pay too much attention to it. If you just want the town to do its own thing, if you just want the town to do its own thing, I recommend that you put taxes on low and simply build um, buildings that promote growth. That promotes growth. Another thing that's that would be very useful for you is universities, which will, which will provide tech points for your faction, and that's going to increase your tech stage later on. Now, <clears throat> I think that's it for town management. Let's talk about kingdom management. <clears throat> I, I feel I feel my voice going away, guys. I feel my voice going away. Mm hmm so regarding kingdom management we're gonna have to go to the castle and over here you're gonna be able to see kingdom finances now there are three budget screens that you're gonna be seeing throughout the game the first budget screen that you're gonna be seeing is your own personal budget screen personal budget report this is the amount of money that your enterprises are producing and your properties are producing. Over here, you're also going to be receive rents from Zendar and small rents from uh, villages. And here you're also going to be seeing the wages for your soldiers and the fleet maintenance and colony import line, if you have any. This money will always go into your inventory and you can use it however you wish. The other budget screen is the one from town management, which you can access by simply talking to um, the commissioner of economical affairs. He's going to be telling you how much taxes are being produced. And directly from the town management, you'll be able to see treasury, income for town, and population. This is the other budget screen. And then the third and most important budget screen is the budget screen of your kingdom. And we're gonna go a little bit into technicalities. We've already went into a lot of technicalities, but why stop here, right? This is your kingdom screen. And even though you give fiefs to another lord, the taxes from all of the fiefs and all of the castles and all of the cities will always go inside the kingdom treasury will always go there right now we're receiving a lot of money but all of this money is going into the kingdom treasury and it's going to be utilized by the kingdom and at the end we have trade tariffs from investing into trade this will go up during peacetime and will go down during wartime realistically speaking that makes sense investment revenues this is the money that you've invested in to further increase the those those um trade tariffs and stuff and then gifts investments from commoners which you're going to be receiving based on a separate balance of power but this time we only have the clergy nobility and commoners uh the bourgeoisie and craftsmen go into the commoners section this time and i'm going to be talking about these and what they do in a second Okay, now let's check a little bit on, um, so we've seen what produces money over here, everything that produces money in our kingdom. Let's see where our money's going. So our money is going on state. 250K will be deducted from the final profit. Um, this sum depends on the amount of fiefs that you have, the amount of world that you've conquered. Currently, because all of the fiefs that we have, it doesn't matter if they're mine or for, if I gave them to a companion or a, or a vassal, this will always be here. Research investments is the amount of research points that you're going to be receiving each, each month. If you reach 1,000, you're going to be going to the next tech stage. And until you reach tech stage 7, if you once you reach tech stage 7, you can turn off the research investments and all of this 500k will be going to your treasury. Okay, then we have Emperor's Purse and all of the purses, speaking of which, all of the purses down there. Those are your 
vassals' wages. Yes, in Nova Ethos, vassals and everybody receives wages, including you. But there is a small trick to this. The more, the bigger salary you have, the more corruption there's in, our, in your kingdom and the bigger salaries everybody's gonna ask for. So if I grab, let's say, 5K, these guys will be asking for much more money than they currently have. Also, uh, your vassals will receive a salary based on their title. As you can see, some are counts, some are barons. They receive money based on their title. Uh, Lord Theodwin will not take anything because his title does not involve anything. Or it might be because he's a good guy. He's a uh, martial lord. Anyway, um, over here we have the can uh, the ministers of my faction, which we'll be going through each time. And after all of these motherfucking calculations, after all of this math, we're still producing 871k. Yes. So, um, when you look at the religious uniformity over here, be keep in mind that this is the religious uniformity of your entire kingdom, not Zendar. Zendar is just my capital, the entire kingdom. This is separate from the one in the town management screen. And now let's talk about clergy power and what each one of those does for yourself. Okay, so, uh, clergy increases religious uniformity for the entire kingdom and also... Uh, decreases corruption, decreases corruption and tax evasion. So practically has a direct impact on ya boys here who take money from you. The nobility, um, the bigger power the nobility has, the larger armies they will have. So the shift in nobility power will be taken into consideration when um, the... AI is calculating the army sizes of your lords. And you will also be able to proclaim edicts faster. Again, the edict system is available uh, during, kingdom, uh, during kingdom management phase. But these edicts um, have an effect kingdom-wide, not just town-wide. And then commoners will simply give you a large income bonus. So if you give power to the commoners, these taxes will further, further, further increase. A good balance, as I understand, is 50 nobility, 35% uh, clergy, and 15 commoners. Uh, but keep in mind, keep in mind uh, that these will shift depending on the events that take place randomly throughout the world. Okay, now, let's go talk to all of the lords. And first person who we're going to be talking to is... Uh, Rolfin, he's our counselor, he's our prime minister. And this is the most familiar, familiar screen that you're going to be seeing through the game. Um, you remember this, if there's any quarrels between two vassals, you're going to be able to ask him, do you have any idea to strengthen our kingdom's unity? And you're going to receive the quest to reconcile two uh, vassals. Um, my will is to appoint new members for the council, but we can't do that because we already have all of the council members. You can also fire council members, but I recommend against that. The more you have, the more options to control your faction there are. Faction-specific matters, you can change your name, kingdom banner, color of the faction, or a full reset if you want to cho uh, choose a different kingdom culture. But we're already on the Calvetic Empire, so we're going to stick to that. And then, you can issue edicts and send gifts. Now, edicts will shift the power inside your faction. Uh, and remember, yeah, it'll give 10, uh, for example, if you institute severe punishments, this will give 10 power to nobility, but will decrease from the clergy and from the commoners. So be aware of that. Or we can prohibit other religions and will increase the clergy power. Or give more power to the commoners, but we'll take from the power of the clergy and the Bottom line is this will this will always remain at a hundred percent. Okay, it will not go to one hundred and forty, or one hundred and ten, or go be below ninety. This will always be at a hundred percent, and the power will shift amongst the three classes, and you need to maintain that balance. 
you need to maintain that balance. Wish to send a gift. Again, this will give you, if you just don't want to proclaim an edict and just want a full, quick um, increase of power on one of the sides, um, you can just invest 100K into this. Uh, this is more of a small, if you want to um, slowly push the power struggle in a certain direction, just to fine tune that balance, okay? For example, in this case, I would like to give uh, some more power to the commoners. And that's gonna, yeah, bring uh, commoner power up to 15, and nobility down to 57, and clergy down to 28. And I'd like to bring that clergy now a little bit up to 35 and bring down further the nobility. But it will also take from the commoners. So you need to do this balance act to keep everybody satisfied. Other things that you need to do, you can do from uh, Rolfin is you can indict disloyal vassals. You can also replace marshals. The exact same thing that you can do f with a normal prime minister. Um, you can tell them to rejoin your party and you can also grant fiefs through him. Okay, now let's check the other ministers and let's start with the court chaplain so this is your uh this is the person in charge of religious uniformity in the kingdom i want to improve religious uniformity in the kingdom if i click that i want to assign you as head inquisitor i'd like to spend some gold and i like to grant privileges to the clergy uh but no i'm just gonna invest mm, half a million florins for six extra points i still only give permission and now we're at religious uniformity, 70%. You want this to be as big as possible because it's going to give you a lot of money. You can also use them, use him as a normal priest. So if you still need some extra piety points, you can do so from here. And that's it. You simply control all aspects of religion with him. Then we have the court constable. He is in charge of armies and patrols. He's going to give you a report of all of the soldiers that you have throughout the kingdom. And currently my kingdom has 4,298 soldiers garrisoned in 10 towns and 15 castles. In addition, we have 1,439 soldiers on the field across 11 armies. It will give you an idea of the force. This is really not that useful, but it'll simply give you an idea about the amount of military force that you have right now in the world. You can also send patrols um, to help defend against small bandits. This is all there is to it and hope to God that they're not going to meet any enemy lords because they will not be able to do anything. And that's it. That's it with the court constable. Not too much, sadly. Let's see. Oh, by the way, these counts and barons, these guys want to join my faction. I'm probably going to refuse them. Okay, what else do we have? Court diplomat. Now, the court diplomat, we can dispatch emissaries to other factions to declare war, declare peace, to declare um, truces, alliances, and so on, and so on and so forth. And that's it. For court steward, this guy is in charge of kingdom research. So he's the guy that you need to talk to to increase tech stage and the amount of money that you wish to invest in tech stage. And he's also in charge of improving relations with your own vassals. So my intention is to improve relations with my vassal, and I'd like to improve relations with Lord Theodwin. And I can do that by sending him an official letter of approval, or I can give him a gift of 20k florins from the state, or I can grant him some privileges. But I'm just going to give him a letter of approval, and bam, increased to 77. Each week, all of your vassals and lords will decrease by minus 5. There's nothing you can do about it. It will always decrease by minus 5. So again, you have to do this balancing act of uh, keeping everybody satisfied. And you can also change the position of vassals in the hierarchy. I can give um, my boy here a promotion, but that will also increase his noble purse. That will also increase his uh, weekly salary. So the money that he's gonna be taking from the treasury. Okay, and then uh, current technological advancements. We can do a one-time investment, or we can modify the current money that we're spending on technology. At the beginning, you're only going to be spending 25K, and then you're going to slowly, slowly, slowly invest much, much more so you can level up much faster. 
What else do we have? The court treasurer. I think this is the last guy. Yep, yeah, that's the last guy. So the court treasurer is in charge of the treasury. So we can pay off kingdom debts over here, but we don't have any debts. You can invest in trade. This is very, very lucrative if, you, if you're if you during uh, peacetime. And you can set the emperor's purse. So you can grab 10K florins for each week. That's going to go into your own inventory if you want to. But I recommend that you don't be greedy and stay at zero because the more money you receive, the more others will leech off of the kingdom and corruption will fuck everybody up. Okay, you can also donate from our own inventory in the kingdom treasury in case you just need that little bit more Skrilla to get whatever you want. And you'll also be able to see a guide with all of the financial information that you would need to go into further details. Again, I'm just telling you all of these so to be aware of these, uh, be aware of these features and not buck up and holy fuck nuggets i think that's it i think that's it for kingdom management yes there's another thing that i need to talk about uh regarding color the colradic empire so um if you play pendor you're gonna know that you can form the old pendor kingdom in nova ethos you can reinstate the old colradic empire to do this you talk to Rolfen and you say, I want to reinstate that old Colorado Empire. It's that easy. But to do that, you need to rule all of the Rodok territories and all of the Swadian territories because that's where the old Colorado Empire was positioned. I have the minimal amount of fiefs right now for me to be able to proclaim the Colorado Empire. And once you do so, your old name of faction will be switched to the Colradic Empire and you'll have access to a few unique troops that are only part of the Colradic Empire. And these troops are the ones that I mentioned to Chris. These troops are the uh, Colradic Legionnaire, the Centurion, the Velites, and the Equities. Uh, to give you an idea, uh, the Legionnaire upgrades into a Centurion and the Velites upgrades into an Equities. Um, the Legionnaires are simply infantry troops, sword and board, and they're pretty weak, so they're just for flavor, just for you to play around with them and test them out if you so desire. Uh, the Velites is simply a skirmisher unit that does not come with a, with a shield, but the Equities does level up into a horseman with decent armor, uh, but according to his level and his stats, he's still one of the weakest mounted units in the game. Keep that in mind. Okay, sure. What? No, that's, that's pretty much it. That's pretty much it. Another thing that you can do is if you want to reinstate the old capital of the Colradic Empire, then you need to capture Aldurias. Uh, you need to capture the Papal State. Uh, practically, the old Colorado Empire, once it got divided, it slowly broke up into different factions until Aldurias was the only thing that was left of the Colorado Empire. So the closest thing in Novathus that we have to the original Colorado Empire is the Papal State. So right now, I guess in my playthrough, my next objective is going to be taking Aldurias. That's what I'm going to be doing. Okay, and... What is it?